We're now joined by Ross Dellinger. SI.com covers the heck out of college athletics and college football as well. And uh, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Ross, thank you very much. We're going to try to talk about the game. Football itself, the teams, the Heisman Trophy candidates. And I'm sure we'll get into the uh, business as well because I saw you have a new note uh, that's up as well. Uh, do you feel like sometimes we, we, we kind of even – there's so much going on, we get away from just the sport itself? Yeah, that's that's kind of what it's uh, what it what college sports has become. You know, we're right in the middle of uh, what I would call the the biggest evolution, uh, probably in college sports history. You know, we're kind of right in the middle of it. It's, it's probably five, seven years of change, and we're a year or two in. And uh, so it's hard sometimes, especially in the off season, to focus on the teams and the coaches and the players when you have so much change going on. Uh, around them, uh, from NIL to uh, NCA government uh, transformation uh, to the, just the future of of the NCA and college sports and, and athlete compensation and athlete employment, it just goes goes on and on. So I find myself uh, yeah, get, being behind a little bit on knowledge about the actual teams uh, <laughs> and need to read up on Phil Steele. Uh, actually, I, I need to uh, just order of his magazine so I can uh, kind of brush up. Ross, I mean, obviously the, you know, Ohio State and Alabama return the best quarterbacks and they've got, uh, you know, your years of, of kind of deep churning the roster behind them. But outside of them, there's a lot of teams you could say are vying for, you know, who are the who are going to be the other two teams in the playoffs. Which teams kind of jump out at you as, as somebody who can make a move this year? Well, I, you know, I think, like you said, Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, uh, Clemson, you know, uh, in a way, uh, every year those have kind of been the, the solid four. And, and you do, you, you, every now and then you got that, that burst of, uh, a one year burst from a team, uh, like a Notre Dame in that mix or LSU. And so you kind of wonder, or Michigan last year, you do kind of wonder who's, who's going to be that kind of new team to, to join the fray? Would there be any kind of one year burst from, from uh, anybody else? You know, it's always, it's always hard to kind of pick that team, but uh, you know, I think you have to look uh, at like a Texas A&M uh, and maybe even a, a Utah or uh, a USC, even under first year coach Lincoln Riley, you can change a roster over, so quickly now with the one-time transfer movement and transfer portal and, and all that, uh, that uh, maybe he can do it within a, within a year. So those, those are kind of the group that I could see squeezing in there. And then they're the real dark horses, right? Like uh, maybe like a NC State um, or Miami even. Uh, again, a first-year coach that, could, that is in the middle of overhauling, completely overhauling, it seems like, his, his roster. Ross, if you had to put money behind either OU here in this first year with Brent Venables or Texas with Steve Sarkeesian and, you know, Quinn Ewers and the transfer portal and all that, and both have benefited from the portal, but who would you have more confidence behind? Hmm. Well, uh, OU, uh, OU lost quite a bit, uh, many of them in L.A. with, with USC. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I probably would go with, the Longhorns, and they showed a lot of promise the first half of last year before kind of falling off there. Um, so I, in, in Sark, you know, having an extra year, another year on uh, Brent Venables, I, I would probably go with the Longhorns, but that's, uh, that's not an easy decision, and that is obviously going to be, a, as it always is, a, a really, really big game. Um, uh, that year between between those two teams, and it, it feels like even though it's only year two, I believe, right uh, well, for Stark, it, it feels like it's so much bigger uh, that game. It, it, it feels like uh, it, it's almost make or we hate to say make or break, but that's kind of how it feels, and maybe that one just feels that way all the time. How much, uh, if uh, you looked at where Dave Aranda is on the respect level as a head coach, not as a defensive mind or defensive coordinator, in a matter of a year, how much has he vaulted up the charts of head coaches, in your opinion? Well, Rick 
quickly, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, I think everybody had, and you mentioned it there, you know, everybody had respect for Dave Aranda from a, as a defensive coordinator in a defensive mind. Um, I think there was some real, and I think I've said it on your show before, I think there was some real doubt that Dave Aranda could be a head coach in, in, in uh, a successful head coach, uh, and be that guy that, you know, removes, is, is not, is not in the dark room drawing up plays where he's uh, known to be so good, uh, but, but maybe somewhere where he's, uh, not often thought of in the spotlight at the podium, you know, recruiting and all that stuff. But, you know, he's, and I met with him back in March. I visited Waco and I met with him and some of the staff. And it's, it's pretty incredible kind of the metamorphosis that he's made. I mean, he hasn't changed completely. He, he still is uncomfortable at times, I think, in those settings, but he knows it's part of it. And, uh, I think he used, He's used his strengths um, to kind of lift up, so to speak, his his weaknesses, and it's been it's been fairly remarkable to watch. And obviously, the season they had this past year, and I covered the Big Twelve Championship game, it, it was incredible, and, and just the whole run, it was fun to watch. And and um, you know, for a, a guy like Dave Aranda, as I, I wrote from that Big Twelve Championship game, Dave and I met in the locker room just for a few minutes after that game, and just talking through about the times that, you know, he, he's got, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of coaches have, have stories of coming from the bottom, you know, and, and reaching kind of the, the summit, you know, a power five conference championship as a head coach. But man, Dave really has an incredible story uh, that goes back to Dave, uh, you know, getting fired at two or three places, being stuck on Hawaii as a fired coach and maybe even thinking about, going to the high school level, you know, all that was just, I don't know, just like 13, 14 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. So it's an incredible story. Ross, I'm looking forward to asking uh, Dave about this the next time we talk to him. He clearly was adverse to the spotlight, but as you just explained, he had to kind of get used to it. Now that he's been under it and, you know, pretty at a pretty high level, obviously, do you think he's found himself enjoying it or do you think he's still as adverse to that spotlight as ever before? Oh, I think, I think he's, I think he's uncomfortable. Um, I wouldn't say averse as much, but I do think it's, it's still, uh, uncomfortable for him. And he just has to, <laughs> I think he has to, uh, he, he's learned at least how to get used to the uncomfortable, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, mm-hmm. so to speak. Uh, and I think that's just, that's how it has to be. Um, you know, I, I, uh, we talked in March, and, and I haven't been so been so uh, um, kind of inundated with a lot as we talked about earlier. A lot of the off the field stuff that I haven't even written the story. But when we sat down, I mean, he gave some just really compelling quotes about how all the difficulties he had um, socially, just speaking to people, and um, and I, I think he still does have it was difficulties, but he's overcome some of that, you know, and, um, and I think his wife has about that. His wife's kind of the opposite of him in, in a lot of those, those regards. So, uh, she's, she's helped him a lot at Dion and I think people around him, assistants and stuff kind of taking up the mantle, so to speak on some of that, uh, as well. But I do think, you know, he's still made uncomfortable by it, but he knows it's part of it. And I think he's, He's crossed a lot of hurdles. Yeah, it is interesting, though, Ross, to see in kind of an era now because of social media and the everything you have to do. You know, Brian Kelly's got to do videos dancing with guys, you know, uh, and, you know, the, all those things you have to do. I'm not trying to knock Brian Kelly, but it is such a different thing. Is where Dave Aranda, if you asked him to do a video dancing with somebody, he'd be like, absolutely, no, that's not. We'll take a, <laughs> we'll take a still photo by the picture of the Big 12 championship. That's... That's good enough for me, and and that stuff just doesn't doesn't register with him. No, it it, it doesn't. Yeah, I, I can't imagine Dave uh, doing any dancing, um, uh, whether it's to get a recruit or you know personally at somebody's wedding or something. I just can't. You know, the, be the furthest thing that would happen. I think is Dave Rand on the dance floor, uh, but uh, it is. It's, it's you know. 
you can, I think Dave probably is uh, proving in, you know, he has certainly there's just a two year sample size here, but uh, he's proving that you, you can do it. You know, um, you can be a head coach at a major conference team, despite um, having some uh, hurdles that uh, you have to overcome in the personnel, personal kind of social uh, environment. Um, but uh, it, it's been it's been impressive to see to see what he's done at Baylor, and, and I'm sure what he'll continue to do. Ross, uh, you know, off the field, there's a lot going on, as we've referenced, and you've referenced a couple of times. One thing that you had out there last week was about the transfer portal and the the transfer windows. It was a bit light on details because they don't have details right now. But in the end, what did this really signify and kind of mean as far as moving forward with the transfer portal and these potential windows? Yeah, you're definitely going to have transfer windows. They're going to be probably finalized by the end of, uh, July, maybe into August. And what you'll have is, for football at least, you'll probably have two uh, two transfer windows, times that, that players can enter the portal and then receive that extra year, that, that immediate eligibility. And if you enter outside of those windows, you don't receive that immediate eligibility. So there'll be one at the end of the regular season. There'll probably be three weeks or so long. Then there'll be at the end of the spring semester starting in like mid to late April and it'll be two or three weeks long as well. So that's the, that's kind of the proposals. I think still think they're ironing out some details and such, but, but one thing is for sure you, you will almost certainly have, you know, transfer windows coming to coming to the portal by the fall. Ross, I don't have the numbers, and I'm not putting you on the spot, but of those who do transfer or have transferred after May the 1st, I don't know if it's been five or 100, how many of them on percentage do you think are getting the waiver and it doesn't really matter about May the 1st? Mm, that's, a good, that's a good question. I, I think what, what you're going to end up, honestly, what you're going to end up seeing probably is this one-time transfer exception is going to end up being – uh, any time transfer exception uh, where where players can move freely um, whenever they want, however many times they want during their careers. Uh, I do see that coming down the pipe uh, because of exactly what you're talking about, where uh, the waiver, there's the waiver system uh, for those who, yeah, right now you kind of have a window, right? You got to enter before May 1 or you don't, you're not eligible the next fall immediately to play. Uh, unless you have a waiver and I am not, it, it's a great question because I, I don't know. And the NCAA so often does not share those facts of how many waivers, you know, have been approved and how many have been sent in. But I'll tell you if if you get a player um, who has a lawyer and who is denied a request to transfer, you could see them that, that, that be, that becoming a big lawsuit in, it becoming the any time transfer exception and not one time. That's that's almost certainly going to happen at some point. Yeah, I just I was thinking about that because I I don't know who it was a recent athlete. They were like, I could go ahead and move out. Does it matter? They're not going to turn us down, or we're going to get a waiver. They're scared that they could turn us down, and then there's a lawsuit. And it seems like it's just a it's just a constant cycle of of really just open free system. And I'm not against. Movement or the NIL, you got to always just, clarify that. It just seems like there's got to be. There's all this talk about rules, and there's just ultimately not going to yeah. be a, really a rule in yeah. place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh it's going to be pretty open and in, in free movement eventually in college sports, which is going to lead um, probably unfortunately to to a lot of um, a lot of poor decisions. Probably, I know when I was eighteen and twenty years old, I. I made poor decisions, and uh, I'm I'm thinking there's going to be probably a hard, a lot of hard lessons. But um, we're in an age of um, of athlete empowerment, and athletes should have these uh, these privileges probably, and and they you know a lot of them have gotten lawyers and such, and and that's not such a bad thing. But there are going to probably be some some bad decisions and re- regretful mistakes. But as they say, you know, learn from your mistakes. So. Right. Yep. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of that. Well, and that, that's probably what will ultimately lead to collective bargaining, right? Because schools will get tired of having to redo the whole roster every year and will want some sort of stability, and they'll finally have to just acquiesce on that, wouldn't you think? 
Probably. Collective bargaining gets complicated because a lot of states have laws against uh, bargaining collectively uh, and unionization, especially a lot of southern states. So that can get a little complicated. Um, you know, to, to regulate the, the NIL space in the transfer movement and everything, to bring some regulation to it, the answer most people would say is collective bargaining. And, and so you feel like that probably is in the future at some point. Uh, there are just kind of some hurdles that stand in the way of that. Ross, thank you as always. Appreciate your time. Ross Dellinger again with us, SI.com, a great college football writer and is all over a lot of the off-the-field stuff that we discussed as well. And we appreciate him jumping on with us on Sikkim 365 Radio. Derek.